Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Amen. Dear waiting people of God, stop, look, and listen. Chances are good that that slogan is seared into your mind and has been since you were a child. Kids are taught in school and by their parents and in books and on TV shows to teach them not to rush into the street, but always, when coming to the curb, to stop, look, and listen to make sure it's safe to cross. And it's likely some form of the same slogan came up again when you were learning to drive. What do you do when you encounter one of those red octagonal signs? You stop. You look left, right, and left again. You listen to make sure there's no traffic just out of sight or children playing. And only when your senses have told you everything is clear do you proceed. Now, the order of those instructions is pretty important. You could maybe switch around the looking and the listening, but you absolutely have to have the stop come first. Otherwise, you would soon find that look and listen only made you more aware of what hit you when the accident came. But what works for managing traffic in the physical world doesn't necessarily work for every reality we have to deal with. Some 700 years or so before Jesus was born, God wanted to prepare his people for what was coming so they wouldn't be taken by surprise and so that they would be ready. Through his prophet Isaiah, he gave instructions similar to those we have learned, but in the exact opposite order. And that's important too. Here in Isaiah 51, verses 1 to 8, we hear him tell us to listen, look, and stop. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was but one, and I blessed him and made him many. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. The law will go out from me. My justice will become a light to the nations. My righteousness draws near speedily. My salvation is on the way, and my arm will bring justice to the nations. The islands will look to me and wait in hope for my arm. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. Hear me, you who know what is right, you people who have my law in your hearts. Do not fear the reproach of men, or be terrified by their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, the worm will devour them like wool. But my righteousness will last forever, my salvation through all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Listen is the first thing we're told to do here. And he says it multiple times. It is the necessary first step in preparing ourselves for Christ's coming. What Advent is all about. And what is it we should listen to? Not the raucous voices of politics or the enticements of advertising or the appeals of false gods and their teachers. Not the raw emotions of our hearts or the rationalizations constructed by our minds. No, there is only one voice worth hearing, only one source of guidance and wisdom that we will give ear to if we want to be prepared for what is coming to us and to this earth, the word of the Lord. 
The Lord who created us and this world governs it still and will bring it all to its end before too long. He is the one with perfect knowledge and he is the only one who knows what the future holds for any of us alone and for all of us together. Here in Isaiah 51, God's people are told to listen to the one who chose and blessed them. Listen to the one who has called them his own. And listen to the one who has promised them deliverance and justice. And these promises were not just for ancient Jews. They are for every believer. And so we listen and believe. We hear him tell us, that it is good to pursue righteousness and seek the Lord. Not that it makes us worthy of God's blessing, but that it connects us with his grace. His law and his justice would not be necessary if we were perfect on our own and holy. But because we are sinners, all of us who live in a sinful world, we need salvation. Not just from the evil of others around us, but also from our own sins and the damnation they have earned us. Can we rescue ourselves? No. No more than Abraham and Sarah were able by themselves to make themselves into the great nation that was Israel. Salvation must come from outside us. And it can only come from the Lord himself. And listen That is exactly what he promises. Joy and gladness, justice and righteousness. God's mighty arm will bring it to the world. And we know from the rest of Isaiah who that arm is. Christ the Lord, the suffering servant of God, the Son of God sent in mercy to deliver all people from their sins with his life and his, with his sacrifice on the cross. And what are we told about that salvation and the righteousness he brings? They will last forever. They will never fail. Hear the word of the Lord. Trust the promises he gives us there. Listen, believe, and be saved. And then, from that foundation of faith and knowledge, look. Look to the evidences of God's grace and love in your past, as Israel was pointed to Abraham and Sarah, and as we can point to our baptisms, to the the witness of believing parents or friends or pastors or teachers. Look to the Lord as the only one who can bring justice and salvation, as the only one in this whole wide world worth trusting with your life and your soul. And then look beyond. Look beyond whatever troubles or obstacles you are facing now. Look beyond them to the fulfillment of God's promises. Lift your eyes to the heavens to be reminded of God's majesty and power. Look at the earth beneath and remember that just as God created it the first time, he will recreate it fresh and free of sin for his people at the end of all things. Isaiah's people were told to look forward to what they did not yet know. Christ and the salvation he won and the righteousness he earned us had not yet come. He had not yet lived among us. He had not yet suffered or died for us. He had not yet risen from the dead to justify us. And because all of that was still far away from them, for them, from their perspective, there was little to separate God's gracious promise of restoring Zion after their captivity in Babylon, his gracious promise of a Messiah who would save them from their sins, and his gracious promise of of ultimate justice and deliverance on the last day. Now, because we have the New Testament, we can see things more clearly when we look. We know the salvation Jesus has already accomplished in the world and for the world. 
but we still do not see everything when we look. Yeah, there are the signs Jesus told us to look for in today's gospel, but until then, we can only imagine what that day will look like or what it will bring us. But we heed his words and look, lifting up our heads and our eyes, because at any moment, we might see our redemption drawing near, the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. This perspective, this expectation, gives us much in common with some of the people we meet elsewhere in Luke and in this Advent season. There is the priest Zechariah, who after the birth of his son sang of the deliverance that God had promised their forefathers and was now bringing to fulfillment. There's the Virgin Mary, who pointed in her song, which was sung the first time in Zechariah and Elizabeth's home, and we will sing it again just after the sermon. She pointed in her song to the mighty deeds the Lord had done for her and his people and pointed to the Savior inside her who had yet to be born, yet to be, grow up, yet to fulfill his mission. And there is ancient Simeon waiting years and years in the temple for the consolation of Israel who had been told by the Spirit that he would not die before he had seen with his own eyes the Lord's Christ. So he waited, and while he waited, he looked. And the day came when he saw and said, Lord, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation you have prepared in the sight of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And that song of looking and seeing the Lord's salvation has also made it into the church's liturgy, and we will sing it at the end of the service tonight. And of course, we cannot forget Zechariah's son, John the Baptist in this Advent season, whose mission was pointing so that others would look and see Mary's son as their Savior. And as they all looked and pointed at the evidence of God's faithful love and the promises he was certain to fulfill, we also, in this season of Advent, look and point at the grace of God. The grace of God that has already appeared at the first Christmas, working our salvation, and we look and point also at the blessed hope that is the glorious appearance of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ on the last day. It may sound like it, but it is not confusing at all to look both backward and forward. Because in both cases, what we see is our loving God graciously and faithfully fulfilling His promises. Not because of any merit on our part, but entirely because of His mercy and always according to His plan. Well, now we have listened and we look but there is one more thing God tells us through Isaiah tonight. Stop. Knowing what we know, seeing what we see, and most of all, trusting the one we trust, we stop being afraid. We stop worrying. We stop thinking it's up to us to solve every problem we encounter. We stop despairing over the troubles we see in our world or the struggles of our own individual lives. You see, there is nobody and no thing for us to fear when the Lord of the heavens is on our side. And there is no situation that our all-knowing God has not foreseen 
Do not fear the reproach of men or be terrified by their insults. The Lord has it all covered. Our Savior saves us from all that too. Sure, as Jesus warned, things will get bad as the end draws near and and nations will be in anguish and we, his people, will face all sorts of trials and persecutions. But if we ever start worrying or being afraid, he tells us simply, stop. The kingdom of heaven, our redemption, our Lord is near. And that means that every promise he has ever made will soon be fulfilled. There is no danger of any of it failing or or fading away because his righteousness will last forever, his salvation through all generations, and his words will never pass away. The one who sent his own son to be our Savior and be counted on for all things, in every situation, through every trouble, and at every time. Trust Him. That's what we learn when we listen. That's what we see when we look. And so we stop living with fear or doubt and replace it instead with with vibrant faith grace-fueled confidence and eager good works and with joy and gladness, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. God himself has prepared us and so we wait with excited hope and longing eyes for Jesus to come again. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please rise. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen.